Mr. Marco, and there are marinas that will take you out to the 10,000 island chain. One is Key Waden, one is Kais, one is Shell Island. Very interesting. I drop you off for four hours on an island and you have time to just walk the beach and find really unique, different things. Last Tuesday, I found a Caribbean vase shell that washed up on the Key Wayne Beach all the way from the Caribbean. With the different storms and Ian that we had a year and a half ago, things are, have traveled getting up to this part of Florida. Or maybe it's yes. because our water's getting warmer and maybe the species are starting to move up. That's Who also knows? possible. You know? Right. Good. All right. So, should I go with my next? Uh, no, let's, let's, let's let our next person <laughs> <on> the <laughs> <show>. You do. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Diane Gallagher, and I am from uh, Minnesota, uh, landlocked. Um, <laughs> uh, land of 10,000 lakes, though, um, and lots and lots of nature, birds, mosquitoes everywhere. So um, I've always been a nature lover and um, started watching Flipper when it came out. <laughs> and, and, and just watched it, you know, every episode over and over. Um, and then after, when I hit high school, after begging my mom and dad, and Flipper was ending, and we, they took, we went to, to the family trip to Florida, and then we did another one during high school. And that was when my dad and I spent hours just walking the beach, looking for shells, picking up shells. We swam out to a sandbar. And um, that was when my love of shelling began. Before that, I was a rock girl, so. <laughs> <laughs> so now I, li I like both. But um, so um, I've also, uh, in my mid-40s, I started scuba diving. And um, I've had the fortune to go on many diving trips in a lot of different places around the world. So I've seen a lot of um, underwater uh, life and um, occupied and living shells. And I mean, I've seen you know the, the, the huge clams in Indonesia and you know from a pygmy, pygmy seahorse that's this big to manta rays to dolphins. So um, you know, I just, I love the ocean. And I've only been here now six years and this is only like my second or third year in the club, and uh, after my, well, first I joined, then COVID came, and then I joined, and by the end of that year, they were looking for a secretary, and uh, I naively raised my hand, <laughs> and they said, oh, it's easy, and Anita was the former, she said, oh, it's so easy. <laughs> so, anyhow, so I'm ending my second year now as Secretary, it has been a great experience because I've gotten to know so much more about shells um, from the people there who are so wise and experienced, and I've gotten to know such wonderful people, and so it's it's been a great experience. So then, when then um, Karen said at, at our board meeting that um, a fellow named Ken Proudfoot was looking for some speakers. Um, Guess who raised their hand? <laughs> you know, I, and volunteered I, me, and I went, what? Yeah. I said, I said well, Kathy and I will do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, she, was sitting, she was sitting next to me. But um, so I, I did it uh, because I'm so naive and, and a novice in this area that I knew wiser people would, would sign on just to cover my, you know. so, so they did. Yep, yep, and here they are. Okay. So, uh, a little bit more about our club. Uh, Andover Shell Club was established in 1996. We have monthly meetings, monthly beach walks, and monthly field trips that go farther afield. In addition, we have shell crafters for those with an artistic bent, where we made the necklaces and the earrings and so forth. Um, study group for those with a, with a more scientific bent who want to know more about the animals that live inside the shells. Uh, and outreach, of which this act is activity is an example. We don't just study shells. We're also interested in the entire marine environment and maintaining that. And I'll just say two quick things about that before we go on to shells. Uh, we all decry the fact that Brazil is allowing a tropical rainforest to be, to be cut down. However, are you aware 
that mangroves, the research shows, can sequester or trap as much as 10 times more carbon than tropical rainforests. And what's more, they bind that carbon more strongly and for a longer period of time. And that's something that each and every one of us can do to try to keep our mangroves in good shape and not let them be cut down by developers or whatever else. Uh, very important thing. Same is true of seagrass. It's, the seagrass is the, is the nursery of the ocean. It's where the little fish begin. It's where the sh little shells begin and have a whole bunch of the rest of the sea life. And so to keep those seabed grass beds in the is is very important. Kathy, just what is it? Seashell. So what are seashells? Can anybody tell me what a seashell is? Exoskeleton. It's an exoskeleton, correct, of a mollusk that has either died, it's made of calcium carbonate, it's either died or it's been consumed, and only one mollusk lives in one shell. Okay, Mo and the deal here with mollusks, okay? Mollusk is the big group. Like we're mammals, the equivalent is the mollusk. So, and there are seven different groups of mollusks, lots more mammals, but but, but in mollusks, there's seven different groups. Two of those groups are the seashells. And the two kinds are the, are the um, gastropods, the one-shelled ones, <coughs> univalve, uh, all snail-like. And there are more species of gastropods than there are of the other group, which are bivalves. Two shells, almost alike, that are hooked together at the bottom and they open and close. Okay, so that's the bivalve, that's the second group of, of seashells out there. Um, uh, I was uh, gonna talk also about egg casings, uh, uh, reproductive strategies. Now a lot of shells, just the females will release their eggs into the water and the males know when that happens and they come along and, and release their sperm and, and you know, everything is fine. <laughs> and then either the little the eggs float in the water or they go down to the bottom and settle. And then the egg matures into a larva and into a villager uh, uh, for some of them. Very interesting shapes. Some of you may have seen the mollusk show on TV on, on WEDU this last week, part of the changing seas uh, thing. I hadn't even heard about this, this new uh, uh, program series, but it's called Changing Seas, and uh, they showed all of uh, lots of these villagers uh, from the ocean. Now, other shells uh, have other, other interesting strategies. Several people were asking, what in the heck is this? Well, this is the egg capsule chain from the lightning well that is right around uh, here. And uh, uh, Inside, the, so the, the, the female lays the fertilized eggs inside these little capsules. As many, they're so tiny, as many as 50 little uh, eggs inside here. And when those eggs hatch, they are miniature lightning whelks. They're already there. They don't have to go through any larval stage or anything. And then eventually, they'll make little holes in the end and they'll all escape. And these things are washing in. Uh, right now. This is one from, I believe, a tutor. They're more oblong shaped, and theirs, instead of being little discs, they're like little cornucopias. Yeah? So where does that um, big long thing actually come from? It comes right out from, from, it, it, from the inside, from, from, you know, the inside of the shell. I actually saw a, a yes. one in Sarasota Bay, I sat, I stood there and watched her lay about, wow. the change just kept coming out and coming out. And then they hook, the, and they hook down into the sand or onto a rock. And and if they wash in, and you can tell there are little a, little guys inside, I take them, I, I take them back. Yeah, uh, but if they're just 
you know, just the... Right. Are they typically right. that size? Uh, at least uh, they can be up to be two feet long. Okay. Oh, yeah, up to two feet long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the uh, olives have these little cornucopia ones, and then the, the uh, uh, <coughs> apple murex that live here, they make these little bouquets, each, oh. each little one. And, and what they do, they communally nest. So when, when, when one uh, apple murex is ready to have babies, so do all the other, are all the others. And so they all come together, and they each make their little casing, and then they come over and they stick it into the bouquet. And then when they're all done, most of them go off to go feed. Uh, they've been working hard. Uh, but two or three of them will stay right around to protect it. And then when the ones that are full, they come back, and the entire time until they are, till they hatch, uh, there will be some of those females that will be keeping guard. So even a mollusk can be a mother and hang around. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Who knew? our, our um, uh, or so that common. is the, that is uh, here a lot. This is the way. This is what they do. They they secrete. They make these little collars, and they so they take sand and they mix mucus with it, and then the and then they just start secreting it out all the way around. And the little moon snail is just sitting up here and just fills that whole space at the top and then deposits her eggs, which attach on the inside. And they're very fragile, obviously. But if you find them, uh, take them home and let them dry, and then mix half and half Elmer's glue and water, and just give it about three coats, uh, letting it dry in between, and they'll be, they'll be fairly stable for a fair amount of time. Now who makes that? This is the moon snail, which we'll be talking about trouble. This guy here. Yeah, we'll be talking about this. Um, and um, then I was to mention also two more things. Um, oh, how shells, how shells actually develop. Um, you've got the body inside. You start with just what's called the protocon, this wee little thing right at the very tip. And the mantle is the outer part of the body. And it, I like to think of it like an egg. When you put an egg into the skillet, the fried egg, you, come, you got the shell kind of in the middle. That's like the yolk. And then there's layers of, of, of eggs that go out. Well, that, that's the man, that would be like the mantle. And that outermost layer of mantle whoops, uh, will, oh, yeah, just Put them on the video. Put them on the phone. I got it. Yep. I got it. Great. <laughs> um, the outermost layer of the mantle has the messenger RNA that will sequence the proteins and pull in the uh, calcium and the carbon to make calcium carbonate and <coughs> make the shell. And the uh, RNA will then tell it what shape it ought to be, what color it ought to be, what pattern ought to be, the whole thing. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing from that very first little tip. Now, in some shells, the, that part will just kind of come out and come over around the shell. And that's like several of you were looking for shiny olives, okay? It's shiny because that mantle comes around the shell and keeps it from getting all scuffed up. And uh, others were looking at this uh, cowrie, so bright and shiny. In that case, the mantle comes out and comes <laughs> up around it, and they're always beautiful and shiny. Cowries, olives. Yeah. Uh, and so the animal's still, mantle comes up around, around it, and it secretes an oily substance that makes it shiny yeah. as it travels along to feed or, and when it's growing. Or when it's off, looking down, whatever it's doing. Okay. Um, you were going to say um, Yeah, and that's the next thing I was going to say is that uh, we have we are fairly enthusiastic, and, uh, <laughs> and we are pretty sure we have more information than we have time, and so my phone is running, and so when 55 minutes has finished. 
Yes. We shall stop. We'd and like, we we'd stop. like, if possible, if, if you have questions, you could hold them to the end okay. because we'd like to really get over and cover the different shells that we've brought to show you and talk briefly about them. But if there's something pressing, uh, right. you know, feel free, feel free to ask. So you can raise your hand, saying, "When are you done?" <laughs> <laughs> okay. So one last thing I wanted to mention on this is that. Um, uh, uh, is scientific names and common names. Every shell has a common name and a scientific name. I used to encourage people to learn the, the scientific names, but since DNA uh, and geneticists are using it to, to reclassify everything, to find out really what's, what's related one to another. And so they're changing the scientific names. And this, uh, uh, so right now, uh, for, uh, I would suggest you just learn the common names, even though there may be three or four of them. Uh, you know, know one of them and go with it. Um, but the trouble with it is that then it's really hard on authors, on ID books, oh, yeah. right. <laughs> because the names change. And before, when the final edit has been out, but before it's printed, it's out of date. Yeah. And so the last, this is the last good one. You've got references on your list. But this is Florida's Living Beaches, 2017, most recent good book. So what do you do? You go to a website. And your handout gives you the um, website for the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum and Aquarium. I would say the national right here on Sanibel is the National Shell Museum. How many have been there? Is yeah. it open? Now? It is opening open. Today. today. Today is the day. <laughs> it's open. Yeah. yeah. We and called them and said, "Got it open." <laughs> Well, and, and, and you can get on their, on their email list, and you know, that's how I found out they are opening today, because they weren't supposed to open for until the middle of, of April, so they're actually running ahead. And so they have a website that'll show pictures of all the Southwest Florida shells, and you can ID them. And now, just the last few months, they have an app for Apple phones. So you, just like the plant apps, how many of you have an app on your phone? You can take a, you see a, you take a picture of a flower and then it'll tell you what it is. Okay, now you can do that with an Apple phone for shells and the Bailey Matthews uh, uh, app will, will tell you, maybe. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's still got some bugs to work out. And the Android one is coming, but it's not there yet. So that's uh, okay. So, Diane, take it away. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what uh, gastropods eat, um, their size, uh, their lifespan. Um, I'm just going to make it uh, quick and dirty. Um, but overall, the um, aside from the cephalopods, which are your octopus and and cuttlefish and nautilus and uh, what am I missing? It's squid, on. squid. Um, they're considered marine mollusks, but they're under the cephalopod. Um, the majority of the mollusks that we talk about on um, homing shells are gentle herbivores, vegetarians um, for the most part, uh, especially the bivalves. Um, when we talk about the um, Gastropods, they are tend to be more carnivorous. They eat other um, they eat other animals, other mollusks, and some of them are actually cannibalistic. So well, you'll see some examples of that as we go on. Um, like the horse conch tulip snail, some of those can be pretty aggressive. Uh, the, the size and weight, the smallest known mollusk was discovered off the coast of Borneo. I know that's a little ways from southwest Florida. <laughs> But, but it was weighing in at uh, seven tenths of a milligram, if you can imagine. Um, and, but the largest and heaviest known shelled mollusk uh, weighed in at uh, 550 pounds, and that was a, that one of the giant clams, which are now endangered, along with so much of our ocean life, um, so much of our life on this planet. Um, so uh, that one was four and a half feet big. As, as far as age goes, the mollusks uh, generally live from 2 to 42 years, um, but they have, have been known um, to live as long as, uh, I don't know if, I had not known that there was a clam named Ming, Ming the clam, he also has another name, he 
Google Ming the Clan, you'll find some really interesting information about this clan that they unfortunately had to, they took, and the only way they could tell its age was by cutting it open. And, uh, but then they froze it because at first they thought um, it was uh, 405 years old, but they froze it. And now we've more recently has been discovered that it was really 507 years old. And it's called um, Ming the Clan because it was born during the Ming Dynasty. So it's, a, it's an old, it was an old feller. Um, let's see, anything else here? Um, the, oh, the Quahog, that, you see that Q-U-A-H-O-G, um, pronounced Quahog or Quahog, there are two, yeah, two pronunciations for that, and um, that has been known uh, <coughs> to live as long, oh, well, that is Ming the Clam, what am I talking about, I get these two mixed up, Ming was a qua, uh, a Quahog, so, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, when she talked about little shells, you can take sand and look at it, our sand, and look at it under the microscope, and you'll find a lot of them are shells, not sand. Micro shells. Really cool. Right. We just, I did, we just took a trip to Key Wade on Tuesday, and I was walking along the rack line where the water was coming up, and there was a nice little rack line. I said, oh, what's there? And I got down, and there were little augers and little serrets and little moon snails and bubble shells and little, little miniature baby shells. And so that was very interesting, I thought, to me, to see that you actually have to have good eyes, even at this age, <laughs> and get down there and look and see. Okay, okay now Kathy okay. is going to talk about I'm going uh, to do anatomy. anatomy. Okay, so we have a very simple snail here. Okay, a mollusk, anatomy of a mollusk, snail. Um, the first, of course, is its shell made of calcium carbonate is the animal's home formed by a secretion of the mantle. Next is the operculum, which is the trap door. Many times you will find... It's a really big one. Yeah. Sometimes you, when they're alive, you'll find the operculum fits in there like that. Okay, so that's what the operculum does. And it, it's the trap door, it protects the animal. As it travels around, something is coming after it, it retreats and closes up into the shell. Okay, we have an inhaling siphon, and that allows the mollusk to withdraw clean water from its environment, even when it is on a muddy or slimy bottom. Uh, tentacles, tentacles are used to feel. It's, wet. it's a way when exploring the ocean floor to navigate and hunt for food. Okay, this one's interesting, the proboscis. It's an extendable organ, almost like a butterfly has a proboscis. It retracts and comes out. And with a mollusk, it actually, um, it's an extendable tooth inside. So it can pierce a fish or another mollusk. That's why when you pick a shell up on the beach and you see a hole in it, you go, boy, that would have been perfect, but there's a hole in it. Yep. Well, another mollusk has come along and put its proboscis in there and probably sucked the animal out or ate it. Okay. So you can now make a necklace. I need to talk a little bit about this. A mantle is a characteristic organ of mollusk which consists of an epidural layer that covers the visceral sac. The visceral sac is a sac that protects its vital organs and then descends to the base, forming a fold that surrounds the head and the foot. The space that forms between the fold and the rest of the body is of particular importance because a good part of the exchanges with the outside environment occur in the cavity or the paleo cavity. Originally a respiratory organ, it has remained such for most mollusks in almost all bivalves and in some gastropods, it's also become an organ for taking in food. And then they have eyes. They can maybe just see dark and light. They're not like seeing colors and they're not really using their eyes. They mostly travel by feel on the ocean floor. Uh, again, the visceral sac is on the end here and I talked about that. And some are blind. 
summer fall. And go by. So, so no. here's a picture here. All right. This is a Genonia. That's the animal. See the black and white animal underneath that comes out? It travels around. It retreats. Um, the Genonia does not have an operculum. Sorry. This is a Conchologist of America magazine. You can get one some month if you want to join. Um, very, very, very interesting. A lot of it's scientific, but it's very, very interesting. So the last general thing we want to say is all three of us recommend no live shelling. And what we if, if we all take live shells, they are they will disappear. And we've seen that how many fewer there are in Sanibel than there used to be. Also, you need to know what's legal to take and what isn't. Uh, you cannot take any live shell in a Florida state park. In many of the county parks, you cannot take a live shell any place in the county. You cannot take a live shell on Sanibel. Uh, so you need to know the rules and regs wherever you go. Great. The next thing we'll, we'll do is move on into shells, and we're going to start with gastropods uh, because there's more variety there. And uh, the first person that's going to talk is, is Diane, who's going to tell us about our state shell. And then I'll talk about our club shell. So uh, the name of our state shell is the horse month. Um, they can, the world's record is actually at Bailey Matthews, um, uh, 24 inches. So they can get to be two feet tall. They're, I saw some pictures online of uh, back in back in the day uh, when there were more large shells of like little toddlers, you know, standing behind one of these, and it came up to their waist and and beyond. So um, they're pretty interesting shells there um the dark that you see is called a parastriper, parastriper. there you go <laughs> so you must start with a p <laughs> and um if you collect shells and you want to you can uh, get these off by bleach generally if you choose bleach. to i mean this is the natural way that a, that the yeah. horse conch comes out of the ocean some people like oh we want to clean it and you can you can also destroy it. If some people use muriatic acid on shells, which you should not do because it can break it down, ruin the color, and actually disintegrate the shell. Um, basically, bleach, Dawn dish soap, toothbrush, you're not going to get all of this off. Over time, when this dries out, the parastrachium dries out, it does flake off. So you can just kind of, if you want, clean them, clean looking. But a lot of people like it natural because that's the way it's found. So, um, again, these are, when they're babies, they're very tiny, and they are, they, the younger they are, the more orange they are, and the animal itself is quite orange. Kathy had a picture of, you can see, can't see much of the shell, but if you can just see the the orange. how orange the big it orange is. thing is the animal that's living that's, in the horse. Yeah, oh, so that's that's the most. It's huge. They're and huge. I have a jar up here if you want to look up little tiny ones that are that are orange, and you know they go down to this big kind of yellow. Orange. So yes, you find so um, they're the, fun to find. The ones are called ponies. <laughs> ponies, of course. There's uh, also one that, all, that we were talking about that's very similar um, to a horse talk that I'm not finding much information about, um, and that's, uh, it's striated. It has, it has lines, it's got a lot in common with the horse conch if it's not a type of striated horse conch where yet, I'm yet to research this further. But inside it's really cool because there are little teeny weeny fine lines on the inside. So. It's an interesting shell also. Um, so it has been our state shell since 1969. However, they are becoming um, uh, endangered and because of um, shell collecting, gathering live animals, because of the environment, because the waters are getting warmer, 
their food sources are getting less. Um, let's see. And overfishing because conks are eaten yes. yes. by us. Mm -hmm. Conk fritters? Yeah. How many people have had conk fritters? Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, we do eat a lot of sea life and that's, you know, but if you're just a collector looking for shells, just don't, don't take the live ones as we said. Um, so they're, uh, they begin reproduction at the age of six and um, they're, they produce a lot of eggs, but for like 28,000 in a batch or per year. And um, you'll have to excuse me. I, um, yeah, I know. I know. You know. If this were the senior version of, of um, well, Nemo, Finding Nemo, I, I would be Dory. Yes. Yeah. 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 She's doing fine. Yeah. Yeah. Keep swimming, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, more, basically, more shells are being harvested than are being born or replaced. So that's that's when we reach you know, that tipping point. When we start seeing the numbers go down. That's a, something wrong. Our shell club uh, shell is the lightning rod. And it named lightning rope because of the streaks that look like lightning on it. Um, the smaller ones with more design are either young or they're the males. These great big mamas, these are mamas. And uh, it's only the, the females that get to be this big. And so if you see a bunch of small ones around the big one, probably get ready to fertilize the eggs that she is producing. And then she'll put them in that uh, big log case. And uh, these get to be up to 13 inches, uh, so this is a pretty good sized one. And they get this lighter color as time goes, uh, goes along. Um, uh, a, similar, a similar shell to it is the pear whelk, and, uh, but it just doesn't go up quite as much and it doesn't have these little points on it. And, uh, but it gets white just like this one when it gets bigger. And so the way you tell a lightning whelk, and the reason we have lightning whelks as our club shell is one, this is the epicenter of where lightning whelks come from, is right here. So that's one reason. The second reason is this is what we call a left-handed shell. It curves, it turns to the left. See my, and let me see, here's another one. Look, is this a different kind? Okay, right, goes the other way, right-handed. Almost all of the snails are right-handed, except the lightning whelks. And so that's why we just. Kathy's going to tell us about um, uh, cock fighting and fighting and. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So, fighting cock. One of the most prevalent of all the shells you'll find on the beaches. is very, very common. They come in many variations of colors. So many times they're like making plaids, stripes. Okay, so this is your fighting con. You find them on all the Southwest Florida beaches. Um, you go down to Marco and go out for 10,000 miles. There, there's like thousands rolling in the surf. Okay, um, they are carnivorous. They are aggressive. If you pick this up and the animal's still in it, he will try and get away and his foot will come out and wriggle around like, let me go. They're very, very um, an active. And you will. And he will. <laughs> they <laughs> won't bite you, okay, but they want to get loose. All right, so, um, all right. So, I just want to show a quick picture here. All right. So. Here's all the different variations of fighting cocks. I mean, you can see them from dark yeah. to light, from albino. Some have stripes, some have plaids. I mean, they're all fighting cocks. And yeah, there's one little shelf of them, you know, in the living right, room. Right. You might but think, right? And then, and then you find the babies, the juveniles, and go, well, well, that looks like a different type of shell, but it's not. Those are the juvenile fighting cocks. Right. So these are king crown conks. 
All right, this is a shell, very plentiful in Southwest Florida. It is not a beach shell, although I found one in the ocean. As it's found on the mud flats near mangrove roots and oyster beds, it feeds on oysters. So in the bag. Okay, so it's in the bag. Correct. The shell is found by looking for the shell is found by looking for the crown of spines protruding from the mud. These spines give the shell its name. The crown conch exhibits beautiful banding patterns that feature black and white with traces of brown. Juvenile crown conchs look different from their parents and are predominantly brown and white in color and small ones have undeveloped spine. And uh, when you're looking for knowing, wanting to know where shells are, this one that is on your reference list is, is really good. It's one that lists all the states because it tells you what you find in the bay, what you find in the mangroves, what you find on the beach, right. etc., where they live, and right. which live way deep and which live uh, up shallow. So that's a good, good reference for that. Um, the next shell, shell we'd like to talk about is the moon snail. And the moon snail is also called the no. shark's eye or, what? Sorry. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, or the, if it's yeah, uh, blue in the middle, a uh, uh, Paul Newman's eye. And <laughs> there are two varieties of moon snails right here. See how this one is higher uh, yeah. compared to its <coughs> diameter? That's not because of the size difference. There actually are two species. One has a higher spire, the other is a flat spire. Um, relative to those, oh, these are carnivores, and they come along with their foot and they grab, grab a, 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 a mussel or, or a, some kind of a bivalve, and they will make a hole. Uh, first, first they put acid on the shells, and then they use their radula, which have teeth on it, which is part of their mouth parts, and they drill that little round hole we were talking about. And then they stick their proboscis in, and the first thing they do is to, is to put in a toxin that will paralyze the inside, so it's not gonna get, try to get away. And the next thing they do is to inject the digestive juices that make it get to, uh, you know, make the, the animal dissolve and they pass by the chowder for This is a very violent lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> Natural, uh, nature, uh, nature. Uh, and now I lost the one. Is a gaudy nautica, uh, which just has. Uh, it's on the poster if you want to see yeah, it. Has, it, has, it looks just the same except it's got pretty designs on it. Gaudy nautica. And the other one that we have here is the baby seer. And I don't think baby seers are ever going to come up with a new name. They look like an ear. Uh, and uh, these guys you don't find as many of. Because just think, there's not much shell up here, for that, and it's a big animal. And so once it comes out, grows up, it can't ever clear get back inside its shell. And so they they get eaten more than others. And so we don't find this thing. Okay. All right. Um, olives are our next shell, um, and they get to be about three and a half inches long at the most. Um, we have several kinds. There's a lettered olive and a golden olive and a dwarf olive. The lettered olive, uh, it would be like a preschooler's lettering because it's just kind of a lot of zigzag lines, but um, the, the lettered olive, they are typically shiny unless they've been out on the beach and in the sun and then, the, then they become dull. And we do use, we always say use a little mineral oil and rub it on there and that'll shine it up again without damaging the shell except you don't walk around with greasy hands for a while. Um, and uh, the golden olive, uh, well, olives eat coquinas and um, small, very small shells. Um, the golden olive is pretty rare. Um, this would be an example of it. Sometimes they also have a very a pale. That's sought after by collectors. Yeah. That's a, I've never found one. I found one. Since 1974, I've been coming back. Novices, I found two. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is just a baby, so this is really cute. And then um, the third one, I don't know if any of us have found. Um, I'd need my glasses and a magnifying glass. It's called a tiny dwarf olive, and they are said to be one third of an inch long. 
So you'd have to like sit in the sand with and you know look closely. I have seen some fossil ones, I guess. But, yeah. So, so that's olives. Okay, Kathy, go ahead and talk. All right, all right. I'll talk and then she can come back. Uh, uh, the next one is the uh, 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 murex, and we have two kinds of murex. The this one is the apple murex, and we talked about how it uh, communally nests before. This is another, it's bigger. Um, and then we have the lace murex that has little spines on it. And these are also carnivores, and uh, they are very interesting, particularly, well, they're, they're toxin that they use to paralyze their prey before they eat it, uh, is a purple color. And particularly, the murex that grow in the Mediterranean Ocean are, have a very purple color to their toxin. And in the ancient times, they used to gather thousands and thousands of apple murex, and they would boil them up, and they would use all this various stuff. It was quite a process. And they would make purple dyes. But it took so many, and it was such a process that, you know, you've heard of the royal purple, okay? Only the royalty or the very wealthy could afford to have a garment dyed purple. And it really wasn't our purple. It's a little bit more reddish purple. And so I'll leave it at that. Okay. Okay. So cones, cones in general, there's 400 species worldwide. There's 16 in Florida, three of which we find on the southwest coast here. Um, mollusks. With the mollusks of the Indian and Pacific Oceans can inflict a very painful sting using a, a charged pointed tooth that shoots out through its proboscis. Human fatalities have been known to occur from such things in these countries. Fortunately, nothing as serious as this would ever happen to anyone here who picks up a cone on the Gulf Coast. He would have to be very lucky to be stung at all and it wouldn't be any more serious than a bee sting. The real purpose of the venom is to paralyze worms, fish, and other invertebrates. Okay, so the most common cones that we find here are the alphabet cone, and these can range in color, and they have letters on them. The wind is not Yes, all right, alphabet cone. They're called that because, if you look closely, we can actually sometimes see a letter of the alphabet on the cone. Many people like to collect them so they can get their initials. Yeah. <laughs> and they, the author of this book from Sanibel, his name's Harlan Wood, Wood, Whitcoff, um, he has a gold alphabet cone that he wears. It's his favorite shell. He wears shirts that are covered with cones and pants. He's written many, many books. That love of, of the southwest Florida coast. One for my kids for every every alphabet, you know, every every letter of the alphabet. Is yeah, but they're I found one that said C O N E. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. I want to see it. Did you bring it? <laughs> All right. So, these are truly beautiful shells ranging from pale yellow to a deep <coughs> chocolate color. Most have a low concave spire. This is your spire. Um, and final rows of orange dashes and checks. They're approximately three inches. You can get some that might be a little, maybe four inches would be rare, but they're usually four inches and less as far as a alphabet cone. Florida cones come in yellow to a deep orange. It's a much smaller cone, little, maybe an inch, inch and a half or two, maybe two would be a lot. Um, color can be subdued, yellow, orange color, sometimes with a pale white stripe surrounding the shell, while some may be lighter in color and beach-worn shells may have no color at all. Uh, Jasper cone, which I don't have a sample, but it's a real teeny little shell. It's literally like a quarter, to an eighth to a quarter of an inch. Small, brown, has brown on it, white. Uh, I found one on Tuesday. I mean, down, like literally climbing a little jasper. Okay, next. Okay, the nutmeg uh, looks sort of like a nutmeg, 
and they are can be various colors of brown and white. Uh, and they're when you're down up near Tampa, they're almost all white. The further south you go down into the Keys, they get even darker than here. This is from around here, kind of in between. And its relative is the Titan Cantharis. And I always thought, what a strange name, the Titan Cantharis. I mean, that sounds like a Latin name. Well, it ends up it is. Uh, whoever named this shell, they thought that the shell looked like the wine goblet of Bacchus, the Roman god of wine. And so he named this shell the Tinted, tinted because they're colored, Cantharis. Alive, so you, you know, you just try to go, oh, I can't dig it, but um, there are plenty that you find that are unoccupied. Um, we have two basic types um, would be the true tulip and the banded tulip. Um, the true tulip, they all have, they do all have bands of some sort, but the banded tulips lines are very close together and not as dark, probably, as uh, the true tulip. I mean, as the banded tulip. So the the true tulip is... This is your banded tulip? Yeah, this is your banded, this is your true tulip. See how close they are, even though this is a much bigger shell. The true tulip um, gets to be, can be eight inches. Um, the banded, not quite as large. Just eight inches. Yeah. Different, and different um, variations of pattern. This is also a banded tulip. Often in bays. Yeah. You can find them white. Yeah, you can find them orange, gray, brown, tan, all kinds of colors. Sometimes it's fun to find a broken shell um, because you can see, I know you don't have the best vision here, but um, the spiral and where you can see where it starts and then starts adding more and more as it grows and grows. So um, it's, I like to keep broken shells for that reason. Um, let's see, they are the one of the most aggressive um, shells in, in Southwest Florida. They do um, eat other your, or other um, animals, and they eat each other. So, animals again. Right. Yeah. So, um, and they look, I mean, they, they're named well, after that. We couldn't see very well, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know, we, there's the flower tulip, so you can see some similarity in the shape, but I don't know which came first, the tulip or the tulip. <laughs> So, Kathy, tell us about Junonia. All right, so everybody's heard about a Junonia, okay? That is the, yes? On those flower germs, you know, you put it up to your ear, can you do something? On which? I'm sorry. Yeah, you should be able to. And, oh. and you know, it's not really, you're not hearing the, oh, it's really your ear. That you're, that oh. giving it's not the show. Right. That's kind of an old wife's yeah. yeah. But it's but fun to do. And you go up to people and say, hey, listen to this. You know, what do you hear? Okay. All right. All right. So, so this Genonia is a member of the Volup family. It's jewel of the Gulf Coast. Highly, highly sought after by every shell collector that you can talk to or ask. This is an unmistakable flamboyant shell with square chestnut spots on an ivory background. It is a deep water shell and years ago thought to be rare, but today is found routinely on the Gulf, especially after a hurricane or a large storm. Scuba divers and shrimpers find them when dragging the nets who supply shell dealers with them for a good price. Sandville Island is renowned for promoting this shell and over the years, if you find one, it was routine to get your picture and name in the newspaper. The largest genonia I've ever seen was six inches. This one is approximately three and a half in length. In, in a shop in Sanibel is where I saw it. Average length is three and a half inches. I know because I've been collecting them for 25 years since 1999. I have never found one on the beach. I have 18 of them, but I've bought them. <laughs> but I bought them starting in 1999, and they were cheap, and I got every one, and they, I have ranging from, I have three that are five inch, 
real nice five inch ones, two little guys. So I follow the shell shows. Last Tuesday, I found a piece. The week before that, I went up to Caladesi Island and I found a piece. So I'm getting closer. <laughs> I'll keep my fingers crossed. The shelling season isn't over yet. It usually ends around April. It always starts in October. Winter is the best time to shell. The last gastropod I'm going to talk about is a slipper shell. Named because the, the, it's just got a partial shell on the side, and so it's like you could slip, slip, put your foot into them. Or little boats, because they will float if you, you know, if there aren't waves, and kids will float. The only thing I want to tell about them is that they stack themselves, they live stacked up. On the bottom one is a female, and when she lays her eggs, all the males above her uh, release their sperm and fertilize the eggs. Well, what do you think happens? when the female dies. The next one up becomes a female. Oh. When the male all its life until then becomes a female. Yeah. Okay, go next. Okay. They have better understanding of each other. Uh, okay, I am going to talk about, um, oh, I was just going to say with Kathy, with Kathy buying her um, genonias, and um, I have a friend who is a non-sheller, but she was kind of appalled that people actually buy shells, and I said, but I said that everyone does who's a real shell collector because you, you just love them so much, and I still say I found all my shells. I just found some of them in stores. Thrift <laughs> <laughs> shops are good, right? Know, online, are good. so you still good find them. Well, 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 you know, so yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little, a couple of little guys, um, serrets and augers. So serrets are um, one of these very pointy on the end. They are, um, if you have an aquarium, you want some serrets in your aquarium because they are great cleaners. They're bumpy on the outside. They have uh, like a row of beads and bumps and um, they, they will clean up the, not only the glass, but they'll clean, they clean up detritus, which is fish poop, if you don't know that what that is. And um, so the serrets are, are nice little shells that are helpful. Um, and then augers are come to be a little larger. This is a, a pretty good sized one. They have a row of they have rows that the spirals go this way, but then within each spiral, I don't are they ribs? Mm -hmm. with little lines going up and down. So it's a spiral with little um, ribs going up and down, and they can be very very sharp. This one is quite sharp. And um, let's see, what do they, these guys, um, uh, the serrets are omnivores because they not only eat, so meaning that they're both eat the herbal stuff, but they will also eat dead animals, um, dead fish in the aquarium, whatever. Um, and then serrets are a whole slew of different kinds. Um, if you go on the Bailey Matthews, you'll see different kinds, but they, I found it hard to distinguish between some of them. Um, uh, there is also one called a stocky serrat, which I think I have, I think this is one. They tend to be a light background with black bumps and dots, and, um, you know, stocky is, sounds better than a fat serrat, I guess. <laughs> but, um, they're, they also um, are detritus and so on. So, and the augers, um, they're found in deeper water off both coasts, but they, they, they wash ashore. Um, they're related to the cone snails that um, Kathy talked about, and they use um, venom also on their prey. Um, they have little tiny harpoons you can describe. Um, and the, at, at the National Shell Museum, um, they have a large reproduction of an auger on display. And one other one.
here, down off of Marco, off of 10,000 Island. Some of uh, Morgan Island, you'll just you get off the boat and you're literally stepping on them. They're everywhere. Um, very, very common. So they're just squiggly little snails, okay? And they live life attached to the bottom of the ocean or to other worm snails and feed on suspended plankton and dead, dead snails and fecal matter. Their environment dictates their uncoiled growths. Multiple Florida worm snails literally tie themselves together in knots. Worm snails are brownish, but the Florida worm snail has a white spiral tip. So that is a snail. All right. We've got just a couple of seconds left. But yeah, when I checked, just... it was 44 seconds. And so I'll just say, <laughs> we are not going to get two bivalves. Our time is up. Oh. But the bivalves are the ones that are vegetarians and two shells together. Uh, right. I wouldn't go on holding this one. This is Van Heining's cockle. And it's the only, it's, it's only found in Southwest Florida. This is, this is us. But, and you think about the, the song, you know, cockles and mussels. I never knew what cockles were. Alive, alive, up. Yeah. We got and this like is it. a calico clam, very, very plentiful here, common. You yeah. see it on the beaches all the time. Um, so it is a bivalve because it's joined by a hinge. And they say they're very good to eat. Ten different kinds of arcs. We've got a summery clam, which you can tell uh, if you see it more closely, you can come up. Um, it, it looks like uh, this is the center, and then the rays are going out from it. Um, I found a lot of these um, when they were building some homes in, my, in the development that I live in. Um, in. In the dirt, you find a lot of shells and fossilized shells in um, Florida soil. So. Thank you. Oh, real quick. Well, okay. okay it's over. Everybody's, everybody's, everybody knows what coquinas are. The little teeny colorful. Red, they come sun rayed, um, orange, white, blue, purple. They pop out of the sand. You'll see the little sanderling birds eating them, okay, along the surf when the when the wave comes up and back. And those are coquinas. And angel wings are beautiful. Very <laughs> fragile. Well done. Well done. Very, very good. Thank you all. Thank you.